Now, let the torment begin. The title of tonight's message is No Peas, Please. We are in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. You'll understand why the title is No Peas, Please after a little bit. Starting in chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient <laughs> unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No peace, please. Let's go back to verse 5. Point number one is, I had a thought. Most people I know, probably not you, as a group that was here last week, I think. Most people I know don't ever have a thought. I guess they're afraid to have a thought. It's like an accident taking place if they have a thought, you know. They're afraid of it. We are supposed to have thinking like the Lord Jesus, like his thinking. Romans 8, 29, for whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of Christ. In the book of Romans, it tells us we have the mind of Christ. The Bible tells us very plainly that you're supposed to be thinking like Jesus. In other words, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Most people I meet, their thinking is what I call stinking thinking. Because they don't think right thoughts. We're not supposed to just think good thoughts. We're supposed to think the best thoughts. Everything we do should be geared around Christ himself. Everything we do. Doesn't matter what it is. Everything. That's why some people who are Christians get married and stay that way and have good relationships for many, many, many years. And other people go through relationships like a revolving door at a market or something, you know. And uh, it's sad to watch people like that. I, I run into people, it's common, that have been married four or five times, you know. I just, I, it's really sad to me when I interview a woman, say for instance, and she tells me the name of her children and every child, five children, they all got different last names. That's sad. And they don't understand, they're not living, they're existing, having babies. To do what? Probably the way they're going to be brought up, they're going to do the same things their parents did. Because you learn what you see, not what you're told. So our thinking is to be conformed to the image of Christ, and that means our attitudes are going to change, and our attitude means change means that we're going to submit ourselves to the Word of God. Whether we like it or not, whether we understand it or not, is totally irrelevant. There's a lot of things in this book that I don't understand. I've been asking God for 44 years to tell me why he made women. <laughs> Haven't got a good answer yet. And you know, one of the biggest problems in our world is sex. Not sex itself, but the abuse of it. And I often question God. I said, God, why do you give us this beautiful gift between a man and a woman in marriage and then put all these taboos and restrictions on it, you know? The cows don't have a problem with that. You ever notice that? The bull and the pastor are always walking around with a smile. <laughs> you, know, you don't ever pay no attention to them guys? They're always smiling. You know? They don't know who their children are and don't care, right? And I said, God, I don't understand this, you know? You know, God could have done it differently. He didn't have to make women. Or men. He could have made people and he could have made us asexual. We'd be like earthworms. He said, We want to have a baby, just cut off an arm, lay it on the table, baby grows and a new arm grows over here. You know, that's, that's what earthworms do. They cut them in half and they can, they can grow bodies back. You know, that's pretty cool. I thought, well, that would have solved a lot of problems, wouldn't it? 
Sure wouldn't have had a bunch of sex and advertising, that's for sure. <coughs> it would have been taken care of. I don't understand all of the thing, but I have to submit to God's word. God said that a man and a woman, not a man and a man, not a woman and a woman, man and a woman should get married and the twain shall become one flesh. And that's supposed to last, and that's why I don't like weddings, because people come and stand in front of me and say, I will love, honor, and cherish, and obey until death do us part. And then six months later, they're getting a divorce. And I'm like, wait it, hold it. You said till death do you part. You promised that in front of me. How come one of you is still alive? I get really irritated with that. All, all that goes on in America today with weddings really is nothing but legalized adultery. That's all it is. We get a piece of paper. We sleep with this person. Then we get another piece of paper that says, I don't have to sleep with them anymore. We get another piece of paper sleep with somebody else. That's all it is. Legalized adultery. Because we don't want to make things work. We don't want to have to die to self and maybe make some right decisions. We just want what we want when we want it. That's all we want. We're like little babies when they're born, screaming. Only people are 40 years old still doing it. Our attitude should be, I will submit to your word, Lord, whether I understand it or not. There's a lot of things in here I don't quite understand. And there's a lot of things I don't know if I necessarily like them, you know. God's the one that said not to be a liar, a cheat, a thief, right? Don't covet. Don't be a drunk. Well, I'm looking at some of you. I'd like to get drunk. Of course, I'm not naming any names, but there's a couple of you in here could drive me to drinking. Mentioning no names, one eye. <laughs> <laughs> some of the way people I've been doing this job for 40 years you don't think I get a little tired of it sometimes no, I get tired of listening to Martin whine he did that once <laughs> he doesn't whine but we do, talk, we do share sometimes our frustrations with you know sometimes we look at each other and say why is everybody comes to God tell crazy well it's not you it's that other group you know the ones that were here <laughs> They were here before, you know. I don't know why God says all the things he says, but as a Christian, my job is to submit to God's word. If I want to make God happy, I'm going to do what God says. Later on, by and by, someday, maybe when I face him face to face, I'll understand it. Right now, my job is to obey him. I don't like preaching particularly. I don't like having to stand here and tell you this stuff that you really should already know. But you don't. Otherwise, you wouldn't be looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. <laughs> and you need to understand that this Christ, according to verse 6, where it says, um, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You don't have to rob something that belongs to you, do you? John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. And in verse 14, it says that Word that was God became flesh, was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what He appeared to us. But He is the Creator. He's God. But you see, God had a problem. His problem was He didn't want to do what He could do, which was fly down here in a flaming chariot, tell everybody to get with the program or I'm going to kill you all. And he could have done that and he'd have been justified because it's his creation. He can do anything he wants to with it. It's like when you buy a car. You can treat it nice or you can abuse it. It's yours, right? Some people feel that way about their husbands and wives. Well, I got them now. I'll abuse them, you know. Jesus is the very creator of the universe. And the Bible is very plain about that. And yet there's a lot of people that don't want to believe that. And if you don't want to, you know, you could join the Mormons. They believe there's a whole bunch of gods. Or you could join up with the Jehovah's Witnesses because they don't believe Jesus is really God the creator. They believe he was like, you know, this lesser character that Jehovah God created, you know. Or you can really get spiritual and be the, a Christian scientist because they don't believe that the material world exists. <coughs> I always thought that was convenient. 
They believe that everything you see is a lower sense of material apprehension. It doesn't really exist, and that's why you can never be sick in your mortal body, because it doesn't exist. But they feed it, they clothe it, they house it. So I call it religious schizophrenia. There's people with dual personalities there. Point number two. I made myself. When Jesus came to earth, he made himself of no reputation. He was God. In fact, one preacher said it this way, he was, is God, he is, is God, he will be, is God. Not good grammar, but it sure illustrates the point. And he made himself of no, repu uh, no reputation, and he was ordinary looking. When, when Jesus came, they crucified him because they didn't know he was God. They didn't understand that. They didn't get it. Why? He looked ordinary, plain, simple. He never exercised his godhood like he could have. He could have come down here with a guitar in his hand and looked like a rock star. Because that, that, we like that. You know, that's why when Israel wanted a king, they wanted somebody that got ended up with Saul because he looked good and he was taller than everybody else. You'd have made a good king, man. You got to be at least shoulder and up higher than everybody else. See, because we judge by appearances, don't we? And rather than truth. When Jesus came, there was no ego, there was no pride, and that's what we're supposed to be demonstrating. We're supposed to be making ourselves with no reputation. And I want you to know, I know from experience, that's hard. My life's desire when I was young was just to be a rock and roll singer. I was working in nightclubs. I was doing a lot of different things and musical comedies and stuff like that. I enjoyed it. And then God called me to preach. Well, that wasn't what I had in mind. I was going to be somebody. I was going to be on TV going, Stella, Stella. Who's Stella? I don't even know. <laughs> I wanted to. Be important, you know. And, of course, God allowed me to do a lot of things after I became a Christian. But it was different than what I used to do. I really enjoyed singing in clubs to a bunch of drunks because they treated me better than most Christians do. That's the truth. My wife and I have traveled all over the country, churches, 23 states. We spent years traveling. Sometimes we'd live in our travel trailer for seven months out of the year. And uh, sometimes, well, like one year we did 87 concerts, I mean, that, you know, going from place to place because I can't fly, so we have to do it. I tried flying, but my wings don't work very well. And uh, so we'd drive and pull a travel trailer. Of course, we had our children, too, and our children all sang with us and played instruments at that time. And uh, <clears throat> got to do a lot of neat things, and it was, it was all right to do that. But as I went into those churches, I would always have in my mind that I was treated better in the secular world than I was in churches. Most Christians could care less. In fact, the only reason they have you in their church is because the pastor or the music director invited you. They wanted to put on a program, you know. The people in church, by and large, don't even care whether there's a program or not. They just want to hurry up and get it over so they can go home. But they got to be there because, you know, they got to act spiritual. They can't come back to church Sunday and say, well, I didn't come to the meeting, preacher, because I was watching the ball game. That wouldn't fly too well. <clears throat> so he looked ordinary like a man. His spirit made him willing. Exodus chapter 50, uh, 35, Exodus 35, 21. There's a story in there about the giving for the tabernacle. The people were, And God made an interesting statement. He said, I want the people to give who made their hearts willing. Well, that's what Jesus did. He made himself willing to do what? To give himself. To pay the penalty for our sin, that was not fun. In John chapter 17, it tells us, Jesus said, Father, if it be thy will, take this cup from me, but not my will be done, thy will be done. And that's where he really won the battle for our souls, was in the garden when he decided to do it. And he chose to do it. They, nobody could take his life from him. Well, why did he do this? Well, it's simple. You see, God wanted to be able to provide salvation for us, and that means God had to understand what death was. God didn't understand death until he clothed divinity, which can't die. God can't die. But he clothed it with this human body that could die, so in that body he could experience death. 
So when they drove the spikes through his feet and his hands, he felt it just like you would. When they planted the crown of thorns on his head, he felt it just like anybody else. That's why he did that. So when he tells us to receive Christ as our Lord and Savior and trust him, or if we don't end up in hell, he's got a perfect right to do it because he went through the same things we went through. The Bible says he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. He chose to do what he was supposed to do. So he could tell us to choose to do it and not be a hypocrite. God knows what he's talking about. How can you explain death to somebody if you don't understand it yourself? He understands it. He understands everything you go through, every pain you could ever have, every, every downfall you could have, every kind of temptation you could ever have, trials, abuse from other people. Boy, did he get that. And yet he never sinned. It's all about choices. <clears throat> As man, he even became obedient to the, to, to the death of the cross. And that has got to be one of the most hideous deaths that you could ever imagine. To be on that cross, sometimes for days dying. Back years ago, I had to learn about this chapter. It's one thing to preach, it's another thing to understand it. First three years of my ministry... And I'm going to tell you the way it happened, so I hope it doesn't offend anybody, but if it does, so be it. I preached for three years in black churches. The white folks didn't want me. Some of them still don't want me. But I preached in black churches. Preached in black Baptist churches, CME churches, which now are called Christian Methodist Episcopal. Back when I was preaching them, they were called Colored Methodist Episcopal. That's just the name of it. And I would get calls to preach in sometimes sanctified churches, uh, Church of God in Christ, you know, all these different denominations in, among the black community for three years. And I learned a lot. Learned a lot about music during that time. Oh, I tell you, they got some singers in those churches that are unbelievable. And they got piano players. You, you, they're like cordwood. They got so many piano players. And then piano players, some of them are great. They'll sit there and they just daydreaming somewhere else and playing everything. And they don't ever miss a lick. I have to concentrate or I get mixed up. Well, we got a call from a church in Centerpoint. It was a CME church in Centerpoint, Texas, which is north of Appleby, which is north of Nacogdoches. Brother June, we want you to come down here and sing and, and uh, you know, do a little concert for us and preach to us. And, and you know, I, I, was really, I really enjoyed being in the black churches because things were different. They didn't go by the clock. Everything was laid back. I'd get there at 11, or I'd get there early, and, Church service supposed to start at 11. 11 would come and 11.15, 11.30. Pastor, when are we going to start this service? When everybody gets here. Oh, okay, you know. And, and there was no quitting time. Boy, in some of the white churches, if you're not out by noon and beat the Methodists to the restaurant, you're in trouble, Pastor. But they didn't do that. I mean, sometimes the services go to 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was like an all-day thing. Well, when they called us, they told us that after we got done with the preaching service, we were going to have dinner on the ground. Well, my wife and I looked at each other. We didn't know what that meant. And so I visioned in my head that we were all going to sit on the ground and eat, you know. And so I told my wife, I said, well, if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. So let's go. Well, we get over there. Set up our sound system, do our singing, you know, and then we get done preaching and everything. And they come over to me, a lady comes over to me and she says, and get this, in, in our nice fancy churches, we have a building and we usually call it the fellowship hall. Sounds spiritual, doesn't it? In their churches, everyone I went to, they didn't call it the fellowship hall. They called it the cafeteria. I knew what went on in a cafeteria. And they say, uh, Brother June, we're going over to the cafeteria. And he says, that's me. I'm coming with you. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. Those little ladies out there in those little communities like that, they can cook like nobody's business. I mean, they can cook. And I go in this room, and they got these tables like this, eight-foot tables, four of them in a line. And they got fried chicken, and they got 
pork chops and they got chicken and dumplings and they got and they got steaks and they got I mean they got and then they got the vegetables you know all laid out there every kind of vegetable you can imagine and then the last table over there is drinks and dessert I'm not talking about Marie Callender I'm talking about homemade pies ooh I wanted to stay there well I was Got up, I got up to the table. They had all the plates and everything at the beginning. You know, it was kind of buffet style. And I started to get me a plate. And I looked at the food there, and everything looked really good, except they had a great big bowl of black-eyed peas. <laughs> See, a few months earlier, I was at a friend's house, Bobby Christopher, and uh, I smelled this odor. And I said, what is that odor? And his wife smiled, big old grin on her face. She says, Brother June, come with me to the kitchen. I'll show you. She took me in there, and there was this great big pot about this big pot with black-eyed peas boiling in it. And my nose smelled them, and my nose spoke to my tongue and said, Tongue, yes, nose, don't you ever try that. <laughs> and I just, that day, I didn't like black-eyed peas at all. My wife likes them. She's weird. She's a Texan, you know. I'm from California. We never ate black-eyed peas. We ate good food in California, you know, potato chips, candy bars, Coca-Cola, and <laughs> cigarettes. <laughs> That's the four food groups, isn't it? <laughs> and boy, I'm standing there, and I was going to get me some food, and this three ladies come together, and they said, oh, Brother Gentry, you don't know how this works. See, you sang to us and preached. You go sit down, and we will serve you. Wow. They weren't going to serve her, just me. <laughs> And I got to thinking about that thing, and I said, you know, it don't get no better than this. <laughs> And I'm sitting there, and my wife's looking at me, and I'm sitting there, and then these three ladies come over to me with the food, and they brought me this big plate of food, and it had chicken, it had corn on the cob, it had mashed potatoes and gravy, my favorite fruit, mashed potatoes and gravy, and the biggest pile of black-eyed peas <laughs> I had ever seen in my life. And I'm sitting there with a smile, and that's the day I learned that smiling is a choice. I smiled, they were smiling, and my wife's staring at me. And my wife, you know, when you're married for a while, you don't have to ask. You don't have to talk. You know what the other person's thinking. And my wife was standing there staring at me, and the thoughts going through her head were these. Okay, big boy, let's see if you can practice what you preach. And I'm smiling, and all the time my stomach's starting to wrench. You know, and, and I'm saying, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I'm, I'm saying, I don't know what to do. And I was waiting for the ladies to go so I, so I could find me a pot plant or something to get rid of those black-eyed peas. <laughs> but they just stayed there. And then finally they said, uh, can we get you anything else? I no, no, ma'am. Thank you very much. I mean, I wasn't going to say anything to embarrass those ladies or to hurt their feelings. They were trying to do good. And they got away, and I start praying, Lord, I don't know what to do. i, I got to do it. And the Lord spoke to me very, very Oh, it was so lovely. The Lord said, Brother June, eat what's set before you. <laughs> oh, that's what the Bible says. And you see, I had to make a choice. I could either choose to eat those black-eyed peas or I could rebel against God. And I sat there for what seemed to me like the longest time and I finally made a choice and I ate every one of those black-eyed peas. But I never chewed any of them. <laughs> I just put them down, and they stay, thank God they stayed down there. And I looked over at my wife, and her whole expression changed, and I knew what she was thinking. She was proud of me. Because I did what? I made myself eat black-eyed peas. More so, I made myself obey God's word. It's not about the black-eyed peas. It's about obedience to God, whatever that happens to be. We don't have the right to complain. We don't have the right to say, I don't like this, I don't like that. We don't have that right as Christians. When we go to somebody's house, and this is just a silly little illustration, we go to somebody's house and they put food on the table, we eat it. I've been very, <clears throat> very fortunate we eat with Martin and Mary most Mondays. Mary always fixes something I like. Of course, after this sermon, she may come up with something I don't just to see what I'll do. There's been a couple other times I've had to eat black-eyed peas in the last 40 years, and I just eat them. Don't like them. I don't think they're good. I met a guy from West Virginia, 
and he was like God Jr. And he informed me that God never intended for people to eat black-eyed peas. He made that for hog feed. And I said, amen, brother, you and me, all the way. <laughs> you got to come to the point where you choose to do what's right. It doesn't matter what anybody else says or thinks. People will do all kinds of weird things. They'll try to get your goat, they'll try to get you down, they try to hurt you. It doesn't matter. You act right. Love is dying to self and treating people like you're supposed to even when they don't respond properly. It doesn't matter. It's more fun to hit them with a brick. <laughs> but it's not what we're supposed to be doing. That's a hard lesson. That's what dying to self is all about. Jesus died to self in order to put himself on the cross and die for us. And he tells us, if any man will follow me, let him take up his cross daily. Deny himself. That's die to self. Deny yourself means say no to self. That's why I keep telling people, you can't say no to drugs. You can't say no to alcohol. You have to say no to self. That's where the problem is. Last point, number trace, three. Moving on up. Jesus submitted to the Word of God and ended up with a name that is higher than any name anywhere in the universe. Anywhere. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God exalted Him. Now there's only one God, you understand that. But Jesus was the man. He was the one that God lived in. And we're going to see Him again. We'll see the nail prints. This place where the spear went through his side. It's there for eternity. <clears throat> Jesus says, in heaven, earth, and under the earth. I was talking one day and I told people, I said, you know, the, the Bible says that hell is in the middle of the earth. And this guy comes to me afterwards and he says, oh, Brother Gene, you don't really believe that, do you? I said, yes, sir, I do believe that. He said, why do you believe that? I said, because God says so. He says, yeah, but he can't be in the middle of the earth. I said, why not? He says, because it's hot there. I said, hello. What better place to put it? I've told many people, if you want to get to hell quicker, start digging. <laughs> if you keep it up, you'll get there. <laughs> My mother, and it took me a couple of years to get to where I could talk about this, but in 1971, my mother died of cancer at age 42 the same week that I became a Christian. My mother professed to be an atheist. She didn't believe God exists. She brought us up to believe that there was no God. All of my mother's side of the family, they're all from Germany. I was born in Germany. I'm half German and half Mexican. Boy, that is a really strange combination. I have battles sometimes at night when everybody else is asleep. And uh, they're all intellectuals. Some of them artists, musicians, you know. They're all atheists. My dad's side of the family, a bunch of dummies. They're, but they're mostly Christians, you know. So I'm not sure who's the dumb ones. We'll find out. And my Aunt Katie, my mother's younger sister, after I got out of jail, she said, it's a good thing your mother died while you were in jail so she wouldn't have to hear this stuff about you becoming a Christian. Oh, that was hard to take. She said, oh, I bet your mother's turning over in her grave. That's what she told me. Because she's an atheist too. Of course, you know, she's about 78 years old and she's getting in poor health. She's going to find out pretty soon. I've tried to tell her over the years, for all these years, I've tried to tell her, tell her, tell her, but she won't listen. <clears throat> and one day, of course, the way I got over the harshness of that reality was that God showed me very plainly it was my mother's choice. I can't choose for anybody. I can't save you. I would if I could, but I can't save you. All I can do is keep telling you stuff. I keep putting roadblocks in your way, trying to keep you from falling into hell, you know? That's all I can do. But I found out one day what my mother is doing. Right now, today, July the 6th, 2015. And she's been doing this every day since November of 1971. My mother is on her knees confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And God's not listening. 
He chooses not to listen. We have this life. You've got this life right now to make your choice. If you don't and you die or Jesus comes back, one of those two events, there's no more making choices. It's over with. And the proof of the choice is that God will literally make you a different person. Your attitudes will change. Well, one of the biggest shocks in my life was I had, to me, before I became a Christian, life had no value. I didn't care. You could have died in front of me. I'd just step over you and go on. I don't care. didn't care. After I became a Christian, life was precious to me. Still is. That's why when I hear of abortion, since 1973 we've killed about 70 million babies. When I hear about that stuff, all I can see is murderers. And they're going to answer to God for it. When I see homosexual people, I know God loves those people. And I also know he hates the sin. And I know if they don't repent of their sin, they're going to end up in hell. doesn't matter what they say because opinions are worthless. Mine or yours or theirs or anybody else's. When I go to preach at the jails, which I don't do very often, I don't like going into jail. Too many bad memories. But I've been in there a few times preaching and I watch, I go in there and I see people that have been in there, out of there, in there, out of there, in there, out of there, in there, out of there. And I ask them, you know, how many of you are glad you're here? Oh, preacher, we ain't glad we're here. I said, why do you keep coming back? I go places back when I like it. If I go to a restaurant and they got good food, good price, and a cute waitress, I go back. Nah, she knows that. Most of the waitresses we go into, they'll tell me, I get to talking to them, and they tell me their age, and I go, my goodness, i got grandchildren older than that. <laughs> That's sad. we got three great-grandchildren now. Got to see one of them last week. She lives in Georgia. And I, she said, how old is that little girl? Four? And her mother looks over and says, do you remember Papa June? She says, yeah. And she acted like she'd been seeing me every day, and I hadn't seen her in a couple years. That was cool. <clears throat> every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Even in hell. And they'll be doing that for eternity. It will never stop. And while they're doing that, they're experiencing dying. Over and over and over and over like a broken... You remember when we used to have records? And he'd get a little bad spot in the record and the needle would skip. That's the way it is. It's not going to be a fun place. Why does God want everybody bending their knee and confessing Jesus? Because, as it says in that last verse, it glorifies God. Even for the people in hell to finally admit that Jesus is Lord. Doesn't do them any good, but they will be doing it. And the reason they're doing it over and over and over is because they just keep hoping against hope that maybe if they say it enough, God will get them out of there. But it ain't going to happen. It's our choice. you got to make the right choice before you don't have any more time to make any choices. I wish I could save you. I would. I'd just pronounce you all saved, get a bus load, take you to heaven, everything would be cool. Just doesn't work that way, does it? Father, thank you for loving us. And I know you love every person in this room. <clears throat> you don't like some of the things they do. You don't like some of the things I do. None of us are perfect. But as a Christian, we keep striving towards that mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. And you keep working with us and conforming us to the image of Christ. We're very grateful for that. We're so grateful that salvation is a gift to us because Jesus paid for it. We're so grateful that he rose from the dead. Death couldn't keep him. And he promised to return. Each day we hope. But this is the day. And it's going to happen. And we thank you. We thank you for each person in this room. We pray somehow, some way, Lord, that you would speak to them in their hearts. Because if you don't, all the words that I can say mean really nothing. 
We thank you for meeting our needs the way you have. You've been so very, very good to us. Especially when we know that we don't deserve anything. And you're gracious. We ask you to bless your word in the hearts and minds of these people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.